to the FTN Show. Hey everybody, welcome to a very special segment of Forge Narrative. My name is Paul, your host. I'm joined tonight by your 2019 LVO champion, Brandon Grant. Oh, hi, Paul. Good to be here. How are you doing? I'm um, hanging in there. It's been a long week. I'm looking forward to the weekend, but I'm excited to be talking about some 40K with you. Man, you've had a long week. I mean, this is, I assume that you played all weekend at the LVO. I did, Friday through Sunday. And then went back to your normal life on uh, Monday? That's right. <laughs> life doesn't stop. <laughs> much, much like all of us, man. But that, I mean, that, that's part of what I'd like to talk about when we're having this conversation is, you know, how you balance it all, how you approach the game. Uh, you're you're kind of known for now losing your night early on in some in and some high stress, high pressure games, how you cope with that. And then well, there's a few topics. I won't, I won't overwhelm us all right now, but I also want to talk about these uh, situations you find yourself in, you know, say playing against a bunch of flyers. Why didn't you go for sudden death? When do you go for sudden death? You know, is this, are these even things that, that you think about while you're playing the game? Okay, sure. Uh, but first I want to say congratulations on the win. It was a very exciting game, had a, had a great record. I mean, you, that was the largest tournament in the world, in the universe, as far as we know. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, um, it gets bigger every year, so it was. Uh, it seems like it's always the biggest tournament that there's ever been is LVO, and <laughs> it was definitely incredible to be there and to be able to win the whole thing. But it's it was a, of a journey. It was a lot of intense playing, very high level competition. So it was a blast. I definitely won't be forgetting it anytime soon. Well, with that many people, it can be fairly you know random who you run into and what list you run into. So you, we did a little analysis be before the event, and it looked like the meta, and I'm using air quotes here, is was kind of all over the place. But it was it was uh, kind of centralized on uh, Castellan builds. That was the largest chunk of them, and, and you were one of those. Yes, it's true. I brought a Castellan. In the Castellan meta. <laughs> no, it's um, okay. It's a, it's okay. But you, I think that had to have been an educated decision about doing that. So maybe how you arrived at that uh, decision to, to play into it instead of going, maybe you counter what everyone might have assumed. Yeah. One of my drawbacks is that I'm pretty slow to make adjustments sometimes. So it's good that I have these teammates who come up with crazy ideas. Like Michael Snyder, my teammate who I played in the final eight. He's very good at coming up with crazy ideas, and we were discussing some of his ideas even today. Um, so to have someone like that who can be creative with their ideas and what, what kinds of things are possible is really great. I know that my strengths aren't with the creativity side. They're more with the analysis side. So I can figure out a, a complex situation if you give me all the variables. But when it comes to creative list building, that's not my strength. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's fine. I mean, there's, there's this one of the neat things about this hobby is that we can kind of come at it with all different ways. But you did. I mean, you clearly are, are great at the game. So I'm happy to get the opportunity to speak with you. Oh, thank you. Uh, what I mean, you've probably gone through your list of opponents and stuff before. But are there any that jump out at you as particularly challenging? And because it, it, it wasn't an easy road to that final table. Yeah, I'll say it again. So I'm my toughest opponents weren't even in the top eight. Definitely my toughest opponent was uh, Sean Naden. Uh, he's such a great player, and um, I was honored to play him. And he gave me a game. And it would have been even closer, but he had a couple critical roles that did not go his way that really led to the game going in my favor. If those roles had gone in his favor, I think I still would have been able to give him a good game, but it at least would have been closer. So the expectation was our game was going to be insanely close, and I still feel like it was. It was just the points at the end didn't reflect that. But on top of that, of course, Alex Harrison's game was insane in terms of the power of his list and trying to figure out how am I going to not be tabled in this game, <laughs> combined with, I mentioned previously, my round five opponent, TJ. He's not someone I've ever played before, but, oh man, if he had done just a couple things differently, I think he would have just taken the game from me. He do had a you, chance the whole time. Do you mind briefly running down what your list was and then and then maybe mentioning what, what Sean had and, and, and okay. why that was uh, such a, such a uh, tense game? Sure. So, of course, the Sean, uh, game between Sean and myself is streamed, and um, if you're wanting to know more about the game, you can always look at it yourself so i'm glad that it's out there because i think it's a great example of high level play um, but my list is a brigade of catachans so it's got a uh, company commander company commander with bolt gun and warlord uh strachan uh, a Ministorum priest nine volgrins uh, an astropath eight infantry squads with no upgrades uh, two hellhounds five rough riders with two plasma guns a mortar squad and uh, two wyverns with the vigilus uh, emperor's wrath artillery company upgrade 
and also an auxiliary detachment with the ubiquitous house Raven Castellan. So that comes out to 2,000 points, and once I buy the Castellan Warlord Trait and Relic, I start the game with 12 command points. Um, do you mind maybe uh, focusing on, just for a second, why you chose House Raven as opposed to any other houses? House Raven is the ubiquitous house because of the stratagem that's specific to House Raven. Mostly, if you're taking an auxiliary detachment, you're not getting the household trait. So you're only getting access to the household command point ability. And the House Raven command point ability is the order of companions for three command points now. And all it allows you to do is, at the start of the shooting phase, declare you're using it. And then for that shooting phase, your knight will reroll ones for a number of shots, ones to hit, ones to wound, and ones for damage. Which, with, combined with the Castellan's weapons, most of which, except the twin Meltaguns, do dice for damage, dice for shots, dice to hit, dice to wound. So you have four die rolls up to for each weapon that are being modified by that ability, and each reroll one ability is increasing or multiplying the damage you're doing by a fraction of seven divided by six. So basically take 7 divided by 6 to the 4th power, and that's how much extra firepower you can expect to get out of using that ability in a 600-point model. So you're taking Raven to make sure that your knight can put out an incredible amount of damage in the early turns of the game to give you an advantage in the later turns of the game. And you can afford to invest all of that in the Castellan because you take the Warlord trait of 4-up Invul in the shooting phase and combine it with the stratagem of Rotate Ion Shields for 3 command points to give your knight a 3-plus invulnerable save for a 28-wound T8 3-up Invul model, in the shooting phase anyway. And then, even if your knight gets crippled and reduced to 1 or 2 wounds, it's a Mechanicus knight, so you can spend 1 command point to make it fight as if it was undamaged for that turn. Solid. The Knight Castellan with command point abilities is an incredibly powerful uh, model, and it has to be played around currently because of how powerful those abilities make it. And then the Guard Brigade is very good at giving you the command points you need to power up the Knight without requiring as many command points based on the units that I took in the Brigade to perform at peak performance. And then, of course, you can round it out with taking Warlord Traits and Relics with Guard, that allow you to gain more command points over the course of the game. Right. So you basically always have gas for that car. Well, not always. Um, <laughs> well, in the first two or three turns, if your knight lives. you know. <laughs> that's right. And sometimes two turns of the knight shooting at maximum effectiveness is all you need. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in there, but I wanted to, you know, the, the, the house uh, Terran or whatever is, is another choice. And I, and I see people kind of on the fence, but with the uh, majority going towards Raven, thanks for explaining it. Yeah, I definitely saw a couple lists that were House Tyrannus as Imperial Knight's primary because they were benefiting from the House war, uh, the house Trait, which is essentially a 6-plus Feel No Pain. And when you're doing that on three models that have between 24 and 28 wounds that are T8 with a 3-up armor save and a 5-up or 4-plus invul, that really adds up. That's a lot of extra wounds. Yeah, over the course of a 5-6 turn game. Exactly. Um, and then, of course, their stratagem is the ability to have a zombie knight. So on a 4-plus, your knight is back in the game with a couple wounds left. <laughs> That's a heavy CP investment, though. You've gotta, you, have a, you have to not explode, so you need to have, make sure you have a command point banked to roll that, to roll that 6. And then you got to get up, and, you, and if, you, if you didn't roll the 6, or you did roll the 6 and re-roll, didn't re-roll it, uh, then you've got to re-roll the four plus. So whatever, I, th- I think I think you're dead on with uh, your choice. But you are. I think that's a that's pretty cool to talk about multiple nights versus one night uh, and seeing how that may affect your choice. Correct. So uh, Naden's list. Uh, so Naden's list is all over the map, um, and it's going to be difficult for me to remember it with precision. <laughs> but let's start with probably the part of the list that people least understood. He took a dark Eldar detachment, and it does not have access to the Vect stratagem. It's his only Dark Eldar detachment, and it has no access to that ability. Because everyone who's Eldar or Yanari tends to be bringing Dark Eldar to be like, I have an auxiliary detachment so I can use Vect. Right. And that's it. And that's about as far as they think into the Drakari faction. No, Sean thought very carefully about it, and he brought a Witch Cult um, battalion. So he has um, two of the Witch Cult command choices, so the HQ slots, and both of them have shard nets. And then he has a 15, 14, and 5-man well, woman witch squad that are the cult that allows him to only take one loss maximum from morale. So those squads are actually surprisingly sticky, and he doesn't need to use command points to keep them around. Sticky in the sense that once they get in combat, they have a 4-plus invulnerable save on um, one-wound models, which is 
pretty good for their cost, honestly. Mm -hmm. But all of the witch squads have shard nets, and they all have the ability base that to run away from a witch squad, you have to dice off. And if the witch player, if you don't roll higher than the witch controlling player, your squad can't run. Um, so that can have a devastating effect on armies that rely on shooting to win. So the, um, or the even back strategy of, you know, is not going to work half the time. Yeah, even if you have the fly keyword, it doesn't matter. They're still going to catch you. Mm -hmm. And the shard nets, those give uh, the ability where the witch player rolls a d6, but the opposing player rolls a d3. So you have to win on a d3 versus a d6 to flee. You can't tie. You have to win. So almost the only way to win is you roll a 3 on your d3, and the other player rolls a 1 or a 2. Because if you roll a 1, you always lose. If you roll a 2, the only way you can win is if they roll a 1. Yeah, that's bad news. So pretty much, they get stuck in melee, and you can't run away. And they have a 4 plus and vulnerable save in melee, so they're not easy to remove. So that's already we're starting to see the list the way it can work, is he can get into your front line and just stick there with this big witch unit that you can't get rid of with shooting because you can't run away. So that's the first segment to the list. Uh, the next segment is a Yanari detachment of HQ choices. And he had a bunch of HQ choices that were Yanari, but I'll add them into a Yanari battalion that he also had. So his HQ choices included uh, Cat Lady, uh, the Yvrain, mm -hmm. Eldrad Ulthwan, Magon Ra. I don't think he had a Farseer it's in a, there. It's but a full house. I mean, that's a it <laughs> is. Um, and there's some other HQ character. I'm, oh, no, that's an elite choice. There's the... Um, the Solitaire. Yeah. Um, two Death Jesters. 20-man unit of Guardians with two shield platforms that are Yanari. And, mm -hmm. of course, they're Ulthway, so they can use the plus one to hit strat. He also had two eight-man units of Rangers. Um, and I think that about rounds out the okay. list. So Am some I board control and some deceptive power there. Oh, I'm forgetting the Shining Spears. He had eight Shining Spears. Okay. There, there's the not-so-deceptive power. <laughs> So the way the list works is, first of all, he's got a great deal of CP because he's got two battalions. So he's not starting uh, the game with a low CP count, and it allows him to unlock all of the shenanigans that Eldar can do, number one. Number two, if you look carefully at the list, almost all of his fire support are characters. So Magan Ra, the two Death Jesters, the Solitaire, the Yinkarn, uh, Yvrain, um, all of those are characters. So when you have a 20-man Guardian Blob that can, for a command point, have a 4-plus and vulnerable save in the shooting phase, mm -hmm. if they're already protected, that's a 3-plus and vulnerable, um, combined with being minus 1 to hit, combined with weapon platforms having a 3-up armor save base, so in cover they have a 2-up armor save. So if you're shooting him with AP dash weapons, he just puts the hits on the weapon platforms, mm -hmm. um, means that that unit can very likely weather not just a, a raven Castellan shooting phase, but um, my wyverns, Hellhounds. I mean, that unit can absorb an incredible amount of punishment in the shooting phase. Um, and combined with the witches, those unit compositions are intended to prevent you from being able to target the heavy hitters in Sean's list because all the heavy hitters are either Shining Spears in reserve uh, or characters. Yeah, can't target for proximity. Yeah, got Or um, rangers, and the rangers are just sitting in the back holding objectives. Well, and they've got that utility, too, of being able to target your characters. So company commanders could be picked off and, and in an ITC scoring and stuff. That could matter. I mean, if if you, oh, yeah. if you miss um, uh, kind of misassess that for one turn, you could lose two characters You know, be, be down a couple of points. It's all true. So his list is devastating. Because his fire support elements and the characters can pick up your screens, because um, the death jesters give you minus two to your morale mm -hmm. if he kills anyone, and they hit on twos and wound guardsmen on twos, and I get a six up save. So they pretty much do. Um, They're going to do a wound or two. <laughs> they do a, a death plus D three deaths minus two leadership to two different units every turn. Um, so they're quite good. Combined with Magan Ra, Magan Ra is pretty decent at doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, he can just start picking up your screens from behind this wall of bodies, and you cannot efficiently kill any of it, um, especially if you're a shooting reliant army like uh, Castellan, because if he's doing it right, the only unit you can shoot turn one is the unit of guardians that can, again, be four up invul, minus one to be hit, three up invul, all of that stuff. And then from then on, he's in melee with you because he can get the witches coming in from Deep Strike. He can get the Shining Spears with plus two to charge coming in from Deep Strike. And his game plan from then on is 
wrap units that can't fight him back, kill them during your turn, and then break out, kill something important, wrap something that won't fight back every turn, while the characters also do all of their shenanigans. And in the meantime, the Yinkarn appears wherever on the board that he's needed. And <laughs> When a model shows... dies, he shows up. and Oh, yeah. And he can show up during your turn, an inch away from you, and then heroically intervene mm. at the end of your charge phase. So just because he can't charge doesn't mean that he's not going to get in melee. Yeah. So the whole list is rapid response characters that you can't shoot, units that are extremely resilient or better at tying you up, even if you have the fly keyword, combined with the Shining Spears as Yunari as his problem solvers, plus the Yinkarn as a problem solver. I mean, the Yinkarn plus the Solitaire was so insane because the Yinkarn charges a unit that needs to die and swings. The Solitaire charges somebody within seven who's easy to kill, kills them, and powers up the Yinkarn to swing twice. <laughs> little soul so, burst action. It's, uh, oh yeah, yeah. So the whole list, I was very, very impressed. So I can see how, how this might be able to cause some problems. So how how did it actually play out in your game, and and where where do you think it came down to a couple of die rolls? Okay, so first of all, um, I get won the roll to choose to go first or second, and I chose to go second. What? Yes. Well, look at Sean's list. Sure. How much how much damage can he actually do to me? Turn one. Yeah, fair fair enough. Turn one, the witches can't charge me. The Guardians have 12-inch range weapons. They're not going to be able to shoot twice. They're not even going to be able to get in range, really, unless they advance. So his plan was he soul-bursted them to double move so that they could actually get in range, and then shot and fire and faded with them so that they were out of line of sight in the center of the board, um, and all his characters and things also holding the center of the board, including the Incarn. As soon as he did that, which I was kind of surprised he did it, but I could understand why he did it afterwards— it was basically, if I didn't kill the Guardians that turn, based on their position, they're right in front of my army, out of line of sight, and a ruin. Mm-hmm. If I don't kill them, the following turn, they move outside, maybe even advancing if he needs to, and then they use their strat to hit on twos, with guide, because why not? Yep. Uh, if Eldred. And then you cast Soul Burst on them, and they shoot everything within 12 inches to death. And then they Well, things like shoot. Doom, too. Did, did he have Doom in his list? I mean, that's I would imagine. I can't remember if... Yeah, he absolutely had Eldred, so he had doom um so you silverst them and they shoot and then you shoot again in your turn and then they fire and fade again so if i did not deal with that on my first turn i would almost be tabled at top of two so <laughs> i'm like okay go bulgrins you're the only ones who can save me now so i threw the bulgrins into the ruins that i wouldn't be able to be overwatched but have something like a three inch charge to get to the guardians and then i tried to cast psychic barrier on them and it didn't work so I re-rolled one of the dice, and it still didn't go off. Oh, that's a, that's a bit of a dagger. Uh, it is, because Psychic Barrier gives the Bulgrins plus one to their saves, and with that, I have three-up invuls. So I knew the Yinkarn would have trouble punching them to death with their three-up invuls. Is that why Bulgrins work, is because um, you're able to buff them? Do you think that they that they work on their own just because they're just a, a wall of beef and can swing think, a lot, maybe? I think there are better units if you don't want to buff them. So, for example, Ganyo brought Deathwing Knights. And honestly, Deathwing Knights are totally fine without buffs. I, I, I are, guess. I think that's more of a terrain-centric choice. I could I could be wrong. but um, I think that based on what I saw in Game 5, where TJ brought eight of the Death Guard Terminators with their bolters that are f- rapid-firing from 18 inches away, and they have Cataphracty armor deep-striking into a piece of terrain, so they have a one-up armor save, four-up invul. They didn't need any buffs, but he could have given them buffs, so he could cast minus one to hit on them. He could do the strat where they can't be targeted unless they're the closest unit. They can be super tough. Mm -hmm. So I definitely think Terminator equivalents can see a comeback in this game. I've even seen some people discuss um, mobbing up two different uh, Mega Knob squads, and so you have this 20-man Mega Knob squad that you jump into your opponent's face Turn one. Uh, I've been a I've been a prophet of the Mega Knobs for a long time, and I I never thought of doing something as degenerate as twenty of them in your face. Because you can just de- jump them. They're, well, their shots add up a lot in that case too. I mean, they, oh yeah, they could. I mean, they're just they're they're gunshots. Exactly. So they can go shoot something and then charge something and tie up something else, and then it's can you kill twenty Mega Knobs in melee? No? Okay, you're in trouble. Um, but the Bulogrin, do you think that they are a valid choice? In, a, in I guess, why did you choose them 
Um, if you weren't going to plan on buffing them, would you have taken them? I mean, that, that's the thought process around that unit choice. Um, I think without buffs, there are better choices for Imperial for their role. And the role is pretty simple. Uh, to bully the center of the board. They're not fast. They have no abilities to go fast at all. They're move six infantry. They can't charge better. They can't reroll advance. They can't advance and charge. They can't get orders. So they're slow. Um, the important thing that they do is absorb a, a stupid amount of punishment to die under normal circumstances and hit reasonably well. They're not going to kill something like an Imperial Knight very quickly in melee. There's better choices for that. But if you're doing anything that's toughness 7 or less with semi-decent armor or less, Bulgrins are a good choice. Okay. So those are the kinds of units that tend to be in the middle of the board. So they're a decent choice for just walking up to the center of the board and saying, can you get close to me? No? Okay, I control the middle of the board now. That's fair. Or... If you're facing someone who's incredibly melee focused, like Sean Naden, Sean Naden, and he ties up your units with shining spears and says, now what are you going to do? You can say, I have this unit that can hit reasonably hard in melee. They're just going to go over and punch you. Yeah. So even for a guard player where you can have overwhelming efficiency in the shooting phase, that's not really enough, n- enough anymore in 8th edition 40k. You have to have some option for what do you do when your opponent's Shining Spears tie up three guardsmen right. just in front of your army, and you can't shoot them. I guess and you can't shoot the bit, army because it's all characters. It's a bit of a pit trap. you know. They get over there, and then now the bullet ring can get to them because they're trying to keep you from shooting, and now they've kind of walked right into the bullet ring. Right? Exactly. Okay. So they can be your second line to respond to threats, or they can be your first line to go claim the middle of the board. Or at least try to contest it, as what happened with Sean. Because I assume they make a decent screen too. Like if you were, if you needed to put them in between another unit. Probably yeah, they're they're not bad as a screen. But I uh, misplayed with Sean. Um, I did not put a screening unit between my Bulgrins and his Psychers. So his Psychers did some ungodly number of mortal uh, wounds. To eat them. up you're in the, with smites. Yes. Yeah. Um, but if I just had you know five man leftover infantry squad in front to absorb those five first mortal wounds. That might have helped, but otherwise, keeping the Bulgrins alive should have been a higher priority. I could have played it a little differently. Regardless, the Bulgrins did their job and killed all but four of the Guardians. Okay. So that unit is no longer a threat. Fantastic. Uh, that was our turn one. The turning point in our game was turn two. Sean brings in his Shining Spears as close as possible to the Bulgrin, but nine inches away from a unit of three Guardsmen. He moves everything to go and attack the Bulgrin or the things around the Bulgrins. And um, otherwise, he holds his big witch squad in reserve still. This is where things start to go awry. Uh, the psychic phase goes well. He gets off the buffs and smites that he needs. The solitaire goes and attacks two guardsmen that are within seven inches of the incarns. The incarn swings twice into the bulgrin and picks them all up. And he unfortunately tries to charge the shining spears into the guards unit, mm-hmm. even using the stratagem for plus two to charge. Rolls under a seven. CP rerolls the lowest die. Still rolls under a seven. Oh man. That's, so, that's not what you want to be doing in a, in a tough game. <laughs> I agree. But as bad as that sounds, it was easier for me to get off Psychic Barrier than it was for him to make that charge, and I failed that. So I don't feel super terrible. <laughs> oh, we, I mean, we do play a, a dice game, and, and one of the, the neat things about the game that we play <laughs> and the frequency that we play it is that we experience the uh, the inconceivable, you know, <laughs> the, dip, exactly. the odds off things. We, we, get, we get to see that play out. So it's, it's nice to know that it happens, but it's not something you want to happen to you uh, in a big tournament deep in the deep Correct. rounds. <laughs> and then um, this is where redundancy comes into play. My turn, the Incarn and the Solitaire are both hiding, so I can't shoot them because they're in the ruin that I can't see through. The Shining Spears are just chilling where they landed in the open. So I move my knight forward so it can see the Shining Spears, and I start by opening fire on the Guardian unit to finish it off with Wyverns mm-hmm. so that there's nothing between my army and his characters. Yeah, because okay. other than the, the Shining Spears, he has nothing but characters on the board between me and his army. So I kill them, and Sean's like, cool, I'm going to put my Yinkarn within an inch of them on the other side of the ruin wall. So now you carefully pre-measure the charge between the Yinkarn and your knight to be like 11 inches. Now it's more like 7. So the Yinkarn can definitely make it in now. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I see what you did there. (laughs) Um, His plan is the knight is going to have to shoot the Yinkarn, and the Shining Spears are going to be left alone, and then the Shining Spears will go and do their thing where they kill everything. Um, cause that's what they do against Imperium. It's very difficult to deal with the Shining Spears once the Bulgrins are dead. They can be wherever they want. They get, they can utilize extra movement and basically they will stab and shoot down everything. They have a lot of shots. I mean, they, they're not bad if they're close enough. 
Uh, That's right. And they do great in Assault too. So I split my shots, and I threw the plasma cannon arm into the Shining Spears and everything else into the Incarn. I rolled pretty hot for the plasma, and I think I did something like six, uh, six bikes through various shots died. I think I threw indirect fire at them as well. And he ended up failing his morale check with no CP left, so the bikes fled the board. Oh. Which was a big deal. In addition, the Incarn got reduced to one wound by the knight, and then was barely within 16 inches of a hellhound that Sean forgot was there, and the hellhound picked up the Incarn. You just threw casually 2d6 and a heavy bolter on it or whatever? <laughs> yeah, everything. Just everything. It's gotta go. Yeah. Because I know the Incarn can heal from units dying next to it, so if I don't pick it up, it's just gonna respawn, essentially. Yeah. yeah. But after that turn, most of his tools were gone, and he still ended up giving me a great game. Basically, Sean played the way you're supposed to play, which is to say, I may have lost some important stuff and some roles did not go my way, but I'm still going to try my d*** to give you a game. And he did. It was a very close game. I think I ended up winning by two or three points. Oh, that's that's strong. I mean, that's uh, I mean, it definitely sounds like a back and forth game. It was. You're right. With a couple of roles going the other way, then I mean, it could be a different story. I mean, you never know. We it's the successive dice rolls could have you played out the same way it did, but. You know, those are some pretty pivotal roles. They were. And so after the game, Sean basically told me that he thought I was going to be able to win the whole thing, which was interesting. I didn't quite understand what Sean was talking about at that point. I just took it as a compliment. (laughs) But I understood that the way he played and the way his list was designed is so top level that 90% of the 40K community could look at that list and not figure out how Sean was going to play it. Mm -hmm, Sure. Um, and in fact, it did take me a little while to figure it out. I'm glad it was, he was my round one pick because I had an hour or so after pairings were up to try and figure out what Sean was up to. Because <laughs> um, it was so wild what he was taking. I mean, who takes witches to top eight of LVO? No, but I mean, Sean uh, did. Well, you know, you say that, but uh, you know, I've been staring a lot at the uh, Slanesh stuff. You know, with their with their ability to lock people in and not fall back. I think that's an incredibly underappreciated ability. Yeah, I think you're right because as far as I can see, with 40. Okay. Everyone's so focused on combat efficiency, even me sometimes, that they forget that you can't shoot stuff that's in melee and you can't shoot characters that are behind other units. So if the front line of the enemy army is in melee with you and you can't run away, you might not have anything to shoot. Yeah. I mean, and not to, I mean, he obviously figured out how to make it work. I mean, you know, my list are in theory and you see a lot of this stuff with these components that he has not doing anywhere near as well. So I'm not, I'm not trying to, to trivialize that. I just want to point out that that ability is way underrepresented and just, just for some of the things that you said, it's just, it's such a spoiler effect um, that it's, it's worth looking at because fallback is such a spoiler effect. I mean, fallback is one of those things that people go, I know you're going to do it, but I got to try my best. Oh man, it happened to me. You know? Yeah, uh, exactly. So anyway, not not to go on too much of a aside about that. So th- that game, you obviously won, even if it was by a couple of points. It's still a win. Uh, what's next? Um, so we were talking about TJ's game. TJ's game was very similar to Sean's. TJ had an army that was designed to have characters and units that you can't easily shoot to death that will tie you up in melee. And he played it very well. He made a couple mistakes at the end with not piling in some units that ended up costing him. Um, the way it was phrased was, um, I think it was turn four or five last turn, and um, his friends were watching, and I said, okay, is that everything? Are, are you done with your turn? Is that all you want to do? And um, he said, yep, that's it. That's everything. And his friends were just groaning because they saw that he had not piled in to surround one of my units oh. or or to uh, block one of his characters from being shot. So you the knight that's just moved. Some fatigue, you know? It's... Oh my gosh, you have no idea how much fatigue yeah. is an impact in these finals. Yeah. Or maybe you do. No, I, but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, but I mean, do you think that that was what happened is he got fatigued during in that situation and, and that's why he didn't do those moves? Possibly. I think it also came down to I try and get into the habit of remembering things for myself. So part of the way that I can train myself to remember things is if I remember them for my opponent. (laughs) So every turn, I was trying to be in the habit of telling TJ, okay, it's the end of the turn. Is there anything else? It's the end of the phase. Is there anything else? It's the beginning of the phase. Is there anything you need to do? (laughs) And I think I did that so much, it just became routine, and he really didn't look as closely as he could have. Sure, okay. But that's just the reason why. I was even telling um, Carlos Kaiser when I was practicing against him before the LVO, 
I'm like, if you make a mistake in practice, you better own that because you want it to be painful. Mm -hmm. You want it to be so painful yep. that when you play your next game, you almost have an anxiety attack at the start of the shooting phase when you fail to use the House Raven Costello the, the stat. burn hand learns best. That is the oh. absolute truth. So that's where I'm coming from with all that. Uh, no, anyway. Okay, so he gets in, there's, that's a moment, a critical moment uh, where he doesn't essentially take one of your units hostages is what I can, what I'm picking up. So I mean, I wasn't able to flee because he had already hostaged one Bulgren with one wound left. But I was able to move up and delete a Demon Prince character that was pretty important, okay. which gave me a few extra points. And I only ended up winning that game with TJ by two. So every point in that game mattered. That's two and total over the course of the game. Like you're scoring it up, you're up by two. Exactly. It was like 29-27. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that was a tight game. Um, and I really enjoyed playing TJ. I'd play him anytime. Same with Sean. Like... That's the fun part about these events is you come back next year and you're like, yeah, we played last year. Hopefully we'll get a rematch. Yeah. Stuff like that. Uh, like even uh, as I came into this year's LVO, I ended up seeing um, a guy from the UK that I'd seen last year named Simon. And he was like, oh, hello, Brandon. How are you? Um, stuff like that. It's, <laughs> it's just, oh, yeah, I haven't seen you since last LVO. Um, so stuff like that's really cool. Yeah, man, I love tra I love traveling to tournaments for that exact reason. You 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 see familiar familiar faces all over the place, and and sometimes it is it is it a very high level competition. You give you know kind of forge these ties, as it were. Exactly. So those were the two really close games, and then of course there were the two stream games in the final eight. Um, what did you want to focus on next? Well, uh, you know, we, we talked about playing down with your pieces and that's something that, that you have, have done. So how do you rationalize that? Do you have a strategy, do you have a mode or a, or a gear you kick into like after you've lost the night that you play this way? Is it, or do you always focused on one direction? Basically, how do you deal with it? Oh, okay. That's a great question. So it, almost going to a philosophy course here, tragedy in life is inevitable. And a lot of what you uh, have happen in your life is completely outside of your control. So it was not in my control for Sean to complete or not complete the Shining Spears charge at all. Uh, the only thing that was up to me is what to do if he did or didn't complete the charge. So there's that um, concept of circle of influence. So there's the circle of things that you can try and change. And then there's everything else, which is stuff you care about, but ultimately you can't influence at all. Um, and die rolls are one of them. Um, and certain units eventually getting killed off in certain games is also inevitable. So having a plan ahead of time for those inevitabilities when wonky things happen on the dice, or you face the list that perfectly counters yours and your critical units start disappearing very quickly. Having a plan for when that happens is really important because you don't want to just you know, get angry or <laughs> um, get frustrated and not have a plan. The way I think about it is emotions are something that in the, the scope of something like a competition should serve you. So if you're having that emotion, you should be having it because it's allowing you to do what needs to be done. And if it's not serving you, then you have to look at your own set of beliefs and ideas to discover what is it about the way you're thinking that's giving you an emotion that's not serving you right now. So over time and practice, I've tried, and it's an ongoing process, to alter the way I think so that the emotions that I'm feeling in the moment are only those that are serving me in that moment, which is why people think that I'm super intense or that I'm unemotional. <laughs> um, no, it's not like that. It's yeah. Would it help? Yep. And if the answer is no, then okay, I, I don't need to feel that right now. Yeah, you're not being aloof or ambivalent. It's it's just that this is not going to fix what's happening right now. Something else is. Yeah. If if I need to punch someone really hard in the face, then being angry is helpful. <laughs> um, but I don't want to do that at a game table. So being angry doesn't help me at all. Um, yeah. Fair point. So that's kind of where you come from is you know that bad things are going to happen. You prepare yourself mentally for the worst. And then it does happen and you either are trying to come up with a plan on the spot or ideally you already knew that this was going to happen someday. Um, what do you do now? You already sort of know what to do. And you can start thinking about, okay, do I really understand the strengths of my army? What is it that my army does that's special? either in a vacuum or compared to my opponent's army. Mm -hmm. So my army, for example, has a lot of bodies in addition to a lot of vehicles because I try and take lists 
that are very efficient at not being removed from the table. Sure. Um, so that's a big part of it. So it might not remove you super quickly, but it also means that I still have models to play with on the last turn usually. You can still be scoring points throughout the whole scope of the mission. It's true. Yep. But it also means that I don't get super high point wins most of the time because at the end of all of my games, my opponents had models on the table. Um, my list is not designed to table you. Mm -hmm. So that's important for me to know. My list isn't going to table my opponent. My opponent's probably not going to table me if I do things right. So what do I continue to do to earn points over the course of the game with the options that I have? That's what I have to remain focused on. So even at going back, the SoCal Open, for those who don't know, my final game in the SoCal Open, I played an Eldar list that I went second against, and the Eldar list destroyed the Castellan before I could shoot with it. So That's heartbreaking. It was. It was not statistically expected, but I had this attitude where I said, I've probably lost, but what can I do to get points? Yep. And I just played from there. And I had a few lucky things go my way. And I stayed in the game long enough to actually pull off a win. So would I have been able to win if I'd said, this game is unfair, my opponent is lucky, um, this shouldn't have happened? None of those thoughts or feelings would have served me at all. No, that, so, that's having a great them, point. so having them is not a good idea. And building yourself into a state of ideas and values that allow you to continue even though everything has gone to hell, is super important at these kinds of events, especially a dice game like 40K. I mean, even if you're looking over your shoulder thinking about what could have been in that turn one, it's still, it's still not helping you. That's right. Again, what would help me right now? And if I'm having an emotion or a feeling or a thought, and I think, would it help? And the answer is no, then I can deal with that later. I, I have to focus on something else right here and right now on what I can still do. And, I, and so this is, is this, I guess, the same mentality that you brought with you into your final game? Absolutely. Um, no, there's two I mean, things I want to talk about in this one, uh, with the planes and this, and this mentality for sure. Okay. So maybe you can explain, um, the, the plane list because I've been explaining so many lists. It seems like you understand exactly how this, um, Eldar Yanari list works. Well, in, in this case, he has seven flyers. Uh, that are basically screening a lot of his, uh, his character models and he's got some jet bikes and the jet bikes have a lot of mobility and a lot of, uh, firepower because they have scatter lasers on them. So th I think the majority of the damage is, is going to come from the planes with the Drukari planes being able to actually dump out a high volume of shots on your infantry. That's, that's actually what had me worried was because they can put out tons and tons of shots on that and that they would, the, the, uh, the Eldari flyers would delete all of your, your tanks. That sounds about right. Keep so going. In, in my, well, in my opinion, or where me looking at it without rolling a single die of the game or what have you, looks looks at that his list composition and thinks maybe I need to sudden death this guy. Sudden death being you remove all but the flyers uh, on the table. And I was curious how you you got into or how, what made you not go that direction. Did you try to go that direction and then just did, it wasn't going to work out? And then past that, I think you lost the night in turn three, maybe. Um. Yeah. So two questions there the first let's cover the knight so the knight uh got crippled on turn two so reduced to the bottom tier and then uh picked off on turn three without having doom or jinx up but it only had seven wounds at that point so it was just picking up the spare at that point and he had the tools at least on the surface to take that knight out turn one uh so the fact that he was even around on turn two is, is a little bit of borrowed time and and, and fortunate yes um i was able to completely fill my deployment zone such that no model of his could get within 18 inches of my knight turn one. Oh, wow. Okay. And 18 inches is the range for Jinx. So I knew that I would have at least a four-up invul, if not a three-up invul, if Vec didn't go off. And that would mean that my knight would most likely survive a turn one alpha strike if he chose to go that route. Sure, okay. So I didn't expect to die turn one. Um, there was a possibility that I could die on turn two with the knight, especially because... Uh, Alex did get off all his debuff spells, even though I had a deny attempt. And uh, uh, so, he, had, he had a hemlock as well, and that that can debuff. Um, yes, and but more smart, if, you know, whatever. if the hemlock attempts the spell, the hemlock doesn't have a native uh, reroll. Sure. Whereas the warlock on a jet bike had the relic that did allow him to natively reroll. So he wanted to get the jet bike character within range, so the odds were better of him getting the spell off with good results. Um, but I think he ended up casting it on a close to the minimum casting value and i think i rolled a one and a three or something ridiculous for the deny attempts i'm like well i'm jinxed yep there's that and then doom went off too 
Um, so there was that. But then the previous turn, I couldn't roll saves to save my Bulgren to save my life. So I just picked up all of them. It, it was not good. But the following turn, I made five ups. I, I made enough five ups so that the knight barely survived, um, which was crucial. Um, so again, I can't predict my dice, but I can just reduce my odds, like make sure the psyker's in range, make sure that it's difficult for his characters to get close enough so that they're vulnerable, little things like that. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. The knight, while very important, is part of the overall strategy because it allows me to basically destroy anything in his army. Mm-hmm. The knight's good at everything in his list, at least if I get within 12 inches of the Eldar flyers. Mm-hmm. Um, Otherwise, but, they're, they're neg- they're, well, the neg one hit as is, but then they become the neg two hit if you're uh, outside of that range. Which is huge because then he can lightning reflexes for a neg three. Yep. And then so your guns, your guns are very powerful. When they hit, they're going to do something, but you're not going to get the volume on there to kill a hemlock. And a, a, a hemlock, even with one wound left, might as well be at full. Almost, yeah. So especially if uh, the knight's degraded enough that it's hitting on fours or fives. Yeah, could, could have painful. been bad news. So you asked the question of why didn't I go for boots on the ground, which is to say removing all of Alex's models that don't have the flyer uh, battlefield role. Right. Um, well, we were discussing this earlier. What's the strength of my list? It doesn't die. <laughs> not easily. What's the weakness of my list? All of my opponents have models left and my games tend to be closer um, because my opponent still has models no. left to keep scoring. That makes a lot of sense and you're comfortable with that. you know. So I guess you didn't try to extend yourself when you saw that kind of the, 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 all those points built into those flyers. Yeah, I don't really have a lot of mobility built into my list. I mean, I have Rough Riders that can just appear randomly, but the killing power of the Rough Riders is pretty low. They're mm. good for harassment. They're not mainline uh, Well, units. they're good for scooping in a recon or holding hold one over somewhere else. I mean, they're, they're not bad. They picked up uh, Alex's Warlock, so they really did their job. Oh, wow. Yeah, they actually made their charge. So that was nice. But when you think about some of the lists out there, like, I don't have Yanari Shining Spears. I don't have the Jumping Ludas or Mega Knobs. I don't have a way for my models to really get across the table and be in your face and punch you really hard. And there's, there's no IG equivalent for, of those. I I have indirect fire, but indirect fire doesn't do anything to characters as long as those flyers are alive. So there was really not good options for me as a guard player to make sure that I could kill all of his ground models because that includes Cat Lady, uh, Yvrain, because the flyers are going to screen for her the whole game. So as long as he's got flyers, I'm not going to be able to reach Yvrain, and Yvrain's going to hide in the corner, and I won't be able to table him. She's got the so, plus one to cast psychic powers on everything around her. She, I mean, she's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> But she's already tough, too. So even if a five-man squad of Rough Riders shows up somehow, she's fine. Yeah. Um, So I knew, just based on that, there was no point in attempting to table Alex by removing not flyers. Because he would see it coming, the flyers would turn around, and they'd give him enough breathing room to continue tabling me before he would ever lose all his models on the ground. Okay. So really, I only had one option. The option was, Alex is going to proceed to remove everything about my list that he doesn't like. (laughs) What can I do with the pieces that I have left? And my conclusion was, pick objectives that don't involve killing things as much as possible. That's where um, ground control comes. Sorry, I don't know. I'm not trying to do a spoiler, but that's where ground control comes in later, I think. Yes. And focus on keeping my units alive as much as possible. So slow down how quickly he's killing me. And focus on forcing him to make moves that he doesn't want. So, and so focus- can, can I stop you? I know we're getting all in the weeds, whatever. But when you say uh, prevent him from killing units as much as possible, does that mean getting them in the cover, getting them out of line of sight? Are you trying to uh, be strategic about who you buff with the psychic power? You know, what does that mean to you? That means that I'm selecting who I buff with the psychic power to make sure he's not killing my infantry very efficiently and out of line of sight as much as possible um, and uh, remove the units of his that can score objectives. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because um, the objective scoring units, if he doesn't have board presence other than the flyers, it's much easier for me to keep models on my home objectives that aren't contested uh, in the late game. And it mm-hmm. forces him to start throwing things like his Farseer on a jet bike onto an objective in the mid-game to try and get more points, which then gives me a kill, which gives me points, so it really turns into a wash. So even though it was a bloodbath, in terms of I had hardly anything left, throughout the game I was just focused on how many points can I score this turn, how can I keep models alive. With with those things in mind, would you sacrifice taking shots at things? Would you sacrifice moving out to where you could get a few extra LAS gun shots on something? How did you make that compromise? 
always objectives first, followed by if I can get shots, great. So quite a few of my orders were move, 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 just to make sure that the guardsmen could get on the objective. Um, even though in the mid game, Alex started to try and block me from getting to the objective with his flyer bases. Um, with the move order, I was able to move around his flyers and still touch the objective, or at least touch the range to contest the objective, which means I score it. And because of the mission, I just had to hold the two objectives that I'd placed um, to get a bonus point. So I scored the bonus point every turn. Oh, strong. Okay. Very strong. And well, that, that keeps you from killing more. You're offsetting a point at that point somewhere. That's right. Um, and he basically killed more every turn, except the turn where he failed to kill a single unit. Mm, that's a big swing. It was a big swing because I got kill, kill more that turn. <laughs> and it, don't you feel good when you just killed one unit and it ends up being the kill more? It was huge. It denied him that makes me um, feel good. two primary points, and it gave me a primary point that I wasn't going to have. It's a three-point swing. <laughs> okay, so um, but that's the mentality. Objectives first at all times, uh, and, the, and then killing can come when it comes. And killing the things that remove my ground forces that are going to score objectives. So the scatter laser bikes were a big choice because they're getting soul-bursted, um, and soul-bursting guided uh, jet bikes is insane how much damage they can do. shots. Um, and they're all strength six, so, you know, twos to wound my guardsmen. Not really good AP, but it's still strength six. I mean, they're wounding everything with some decent numbers. Yes. The thing they suffered against were my hellhounds, because they're toughness seven. So the hellhounds actually ended up lasting a decent amount of time. Um, but my guardsmen, oh man, they have no chance. <laughs> well, was he not focusing enough on the hellhounds? Because I, th I thought that would be kind of a priority, number one, because the hellhound is so efficient at killing Eldari. The, it and is. And flyers too, because they auto hit. I mean, it does, it did work to the flyers. Um, but I think the reason he didn't focus them as much is he focused the wyverns harder, which I think was the right call, because the wyverns make his jet bikes very nervous. Mm -hmm. you had, did you um, have Emperor's Wrath? With two wyverns. Yeah, okay. Yep. So he killed one and reduced one to bottom tier, turn one, which was the right call. But the other thing is the wyverns are toughness six, and the hellhounds are toughness seven. And he had a bunch of star cannons, so they were wounding the hellhounds on fives. Um, and These are on the Crimson Hunters, is the star cannons, right? The Crimson Hunter Exarchs, yeah. yeah. So all their fire ended up bouncing off the hellhounds, except for the um, the laser shots. Those are strength yeah. eight. It's got so good AP. Uh, yeah, the the uh, the uh, star cannons have good AP, but they're strength six, and so if you need fives, you, that AP is never going to come into uh, play. It did. I mean, they did they did damage, but the damage was reduced. Yeah. Um, so that was pretty much the game was I was losing models left and right. People said, Brandon's out. Why are we still watching this? And then I just focused on how many points can I get this turn and how many points can I stop Alex from getting? And at the end, it ended up working out in my favor. And that goes back to your, your kind of mental preparedness strategy of only worrying about what's going to help right now. That's right. I dig it, it. If I'm feeling something that isn't serving me in that moment, then it's not worth feeling it. Yeah, it's fair enough, man. I think I think that's that's a great uh, way to live by, especially when you're trying to uh, when these little fake cubes control so much about us. That's exactly right, and it's not <laughs> just dice. There's so much about our lives that are just out of our hands. Yeah, well, and, and that too, especially when you, you mentioned about what your opponent can do. Your opponent, he's going to make the charge, or he's not. I mean, that's you can't really do something about that. He's gonna no. get. He's gonna get his doom off, or he's not. You know, and unless you unless you're in range with a with a psychic hood or something, there's not. It's not. It's not gonna stop that. That's right. Um, you gotta so worry about after, what you can't worry about. After the battle, I can start worrying about things like what could I have done differently? Could I have brought different units? Could I have put them on the board differently? Is my strategy working? Um, did my opponent make a mistake, or did they do something right? Um, all of that stuff can come later. But on the table, it's. Okay, I just need to make sure my psyker has a deny attempt at something, because uh, that's about the only thing I can do right now. Yeah, well, I mean, how does it feel uh, winning the big tournament? It felt really good. I was surprised by the outpour of support from the crowd afterwards. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of people who were really happy for me, and that felt really great. Yeah, man, me included. It seemed like you, you had a tough run. You, you played with integrity the whole way, and you got a real good grasp on the game. I mean, what's not to like? Yeah. I'm just hoping that um, I'm doing my part to make sure that people see Warhammer as an attractive hobby and community 
and one that they would feel um, happy to play in as well. So, you know, it, it's not just for myself to, to win a tournament. Of course, there's that. That felt great. But if I win a tournament in a way that turns everyone off to 40K, there's no point. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, then I go to the next tournament and there's nobody who wants to play me. Yeah. And yeah, you don't want that. Uh, so, but what is next for you? Um, in the short term, I'm trying to figure out what is kind of the best, I don't know, the best way to talk about some of what we talked about on the podcast, which is how to stay cool under pressure, um, how to be competitive in general at whatever you're up to, um, how to have a mindset that serves you so you can continue to improve over time. Because mm-hmm. um, people have been asking questions like, how much time should I put into 40K now, you got, if I want to get objective good at it? About yourself, you really have to be objective about yourself. You've got to have the 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 right uh way to be introspection or introspective and determine what those roadblocks are or whatever your goal is you got to be honest about what your goals are that's right because it doesn't make sense for everyone to say well i'm going to put 40 hours a week into 40k and in this amount of time i'm going to be a pro and i'm going to win the lvo <laughs> um cuz winning the lvo is another thing that was kind of out of my hands right like um you look at someone who's as good as Nick Nanavati losing round five to Alex Harrison. Um, that was a one point game. Either one of them could have been winning that game. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, so it went, they played each other and one of them had to go on. So there's so much of this that was just not under my control. Matt Jones is another one of those things that just is, is not up under your control. And that's- I'm not, I'm not denigrating myself and saying that I don't deserve to win the LVO far from it. I'm just saying that things could have easily been different. And again, the only thing that I could control is how well I played at each game. No, I get, I got that. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't think that you were trying to, to minimize that uh, or your, your efforts. I think a lot of, or everything about the outcome is about the effort. The, the test, uh, as it were, is not, is in the recovery. <laughs> That's true. And, and you were on the back foot a couple of times and sometimes you needed a little bit of a windfall from your opponent, i.e. A, a bad die roll from them to, to put you in a, at least in, an, in not a worse position that you could then make a good uh, plan from on your turn when you could do something. That's right. I just wanted to make clear that um, for a lot of the people who would have a negative attitude that say um, he's not so great um, because matchups or die rolls or whatever, I'm like, <laughs> I'm totally in agreement with you that it could have been different, but it wasn't. Well, we have to, we got to play the hand we're dealt, you know, that's, that's essentially it. And that's what you did in every round. That's, there you go. You're, we're on the same page. Um, but I do, I do want to talk about, I guess, you know, we, I guess we, we talked about it briefly in, in other ways, but, you know, losing the night so early and then you just focus on, I mean, is it any more magical than just focusing on what your army can do to try to get points? And then I guess denying points to your opponent, getting, sc- scooping up, try, all, always kind of, Trying to get that plus one or one more point or whatever to keep you in an advantage. Uh, That's and, right. And then how, if you were way far down, how would that change how you played? Let's say you let's say you were down by five points in uh, the in the top of three. Um, well, I look at the remaining turns of the game while my opponent was uh, considering his moves, and I'd start trying to figure out, okay, how do I get a one point win out of this? What does that look <laughs> like? Do I have to start taking enormous risks in order for that to happen? Um, Because that's legitimately a thing. If you're ahead by five points, you really shouldn't be making any highly risky plays. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can afford to make low-risk plays that give up points, as long as you don't give up more points than you can afford to lose. But, to your point, if I'm behind by five points, I have to start figuring out what risks can I take that give me a chance of making up that difference. Because even if I end the game tabled and lose... If I didn't take any risks that would have allowed me to, to possibly win, then I misplayed. Right. And it's not even like a reasonable chance. Like your threshold, if you're in that situation, I, I don't believe should be, well, I've only got a 45% chance of doing that. I don't know if I feel comfortable. Like when you're five points behind uh, in a three hour round and it's an hour, 30 minutes in, you've got to make something happen. If you can That's come right. up with a plan where it, if you feel like reasonably it's your only plan and you've got, it's a 10% shot of making it 5% shot, I say you do it. Well, a 5% shot of winning is better than a 0% shot of winning. If you take the safe play. Well, so. I guess you look at the, what the risk is. So if, if the risk is that you you lose all your pieces and then the next hour and a half is not fun for you, maybe it's not worth it. But uh, if the risk is you only lose a couple of your units and you're not really, you know, on the scale, not that worse off than you were before, but yet, you know, 5% is your, is your odds for success, man, go for it. Well, I'll give you an example. So at the broadside bash this 
this year, uh, which is the event in um, San Jose. Um, I played Daniel Olivas on stream, and I had bottom of turn, and I had something like 15 minutes left, and then the game was over. It was the last turn. And we counted up the points, and I felt that if the game ended with a safe play, it would be a tie. Um, so I calculated that a tie would set us both off from winning, and I felt that that was unfair to both of us. So I said, you know what? If I kill Yvrain with my Primera Psyker on the charge, I win. So I went for it and promptly had my Primera Psyker die, <laughs> which, instead of being a tie, was now a win for Daniel. However, after the game, I counted up the points and realized that I didn't actually need to take that risk. Um, I would have won. <laughs> Had I just slowed down and at the stop start of the turn calculated, okay, I've got time. What do I need to do to win if I just slowed down? So I was so riled up, not with anger, but almost aggression with, I need to like kill these models so I can win that I took risks I didn't need to. Yeah. So that was a good example of, first of all, I did what made sense to me at the time in terms of, I'm going to take this risk because otherwise I don't win. <laughs> if you were but ever also, in that, that 10 to one situation, uh, you need to really reassess. <laughs> but also because uh, if I just slowed down and thought about it a little more because I had the time to think about it, I wouldn't have needed to make that risk in the first place. So it was a good example for two different reasons. Yeah, I, I like that. What? Uh, do you, where's the next place people can find you competing? Um, I don't know yet. Um, do you I know that I'm, Adepticon? I'm not going to Adepticon, no. I've never actually been to Adepticon. Wow. It sounds super amazing. It's about six, but... seven thousand people. Oh, that's great. All playing 40K. Not all. They're not all playing 40K. It's, <laughs> but there's a, it's a lot. Yeah, I've never been. I guess I'm still kind of a local Southern California guy. So I like attending Southern California, Nevada, and Arizona events, okay. preferably. Um, I did make my way out to Nova this year. That was great. Um, that was pretty cool, but it's it's tiring. It's a lot <laughs> uh, to travel from the West Coast and go to Nova for three days and then fly back. It is when you're so, going to the winter still. Is a... It's true. So I don't think I'm making it to Nova this year. Um, I think I have some other plans. Oh, man, you should. I'm, I'm actually going out on Wednesday night for this year for no Nova. Nice. But yeah, there's still plenty of great guys there, so... And man, that was the best part of the event was just meeting all the people who were there. Yeah. Uh, and that rooftop bar, uh, I can't sell Nova enough for that rooftop <laughs> bar. Oh, well, the bar scene at Nova, that's what it's all about. Yeah, all for charity. Exactly. Right. And then, um, yeah, definitely going to the Hammer Wrath Tournament, which is a local Pasadena tournament here uh, coming up in a couple months. Um, but other than that, um, anytime there's a big event in California, Nevada, or Arizona, um, you can, well, put, put some good odds on me being there. Yeah, well, Adepticon is in Chicago, and it's coming up pretty soon, so maybe you can't make it there. But I highly encourage you to, to make it. The, the, yeah. team, the team event is the crown jewel, in my opinion, of the 40K tournaments everywhere for, for winning. It's, the, it's one of the most hardest to win events. Yeah, that's where it's like um, one. My team, uh, if everyone was paying attention, was three people who attended LVO this year. <laughs> uh, four technically, because one of them had a last-minute cancellation, so they were able to attend on Saturday, but not Friday. We're trying to keep the team competitively around eight people who are into playing 40k competitively, and right now. Uh, the people that we've had, for totally legitimate life reasons, have um, not been able to put in time required to play 40k at the competitive level. So they're not able to make it to LVO, they're not able to make it to SoCal Open. Um, so we're definitely looking to recruit a few more. But that's just it, is even this year, possibly even next year, it'd be very difficult for me to do a, a team event with my team. Yeah, the Depcon team is a four-man team event. Okay, good to know. The ATC is a five-man team event. Now, I did go to the ATC in the past season, 2018 ITC t season. Mm -hmm. um, I actually ended up going with um, Team Zero Comp because okay. they needed a fifth. And that was fun. But again, it was mostly fun because of the group I was with yeah, that, and the great players. Uh, yeah. yep. um, but going to Chattanooga, Tennessee from California, oh, man. <laughs> it's a bit of a haul. Got to come yeah. into Atlanta and then drive up or something, I think. Is, uh... That was how we did it. Okay. Chicago's a little easier to get to. Or or if you come to Atlanta for that, I'll, I live in Atlanta. I'll drive you to Chattanooga. <laughs> well, that's a very kind offer. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but again, I, I don't think I'm, I, I don't have a team for ATC. Yep. Um, so probably not going to any big team events this well, year. Just keep me posted if you don't mind. I'd love to check in with you in, uh, in the future to see how you're doing, uh, see what uh, list you're, you're working on. If there's been any, any innovations since the last time that we had talked, you know, that, that type of stuff. I'd like to talk to you again. Okay. That'd be fantastic. Well, uh, Brandon, is there anything else you'd like to cover before we get out of here? Just thanking you for having me on. Really appreciate it. And uh, it's nice to find someone else who cares about the community and the hobby as much as uh, we do. Awesome, man. Well, I mean, congratulations again. Uh, real proud of, of the accomplishments that you've done. I mean, this is this is huge. It's mega. I feel like the way you approach the game is refreshing and is something that, that we could all lear- learn from. And I look forward to seeing how that evolves over time into your next list and your next tournaments. Well, thank you very much. Have a good night. You too.